Welcome to the lecture on frustration as part of the Law of Contract II course at the University of the West Indies Faculty of Law. This lecture comprises five parts. First, there is an introduction. Then we will look at the test of frustration. We'll then move on and look at the various categories of frustration before looking at the legal effect of frustration, as well as the summary. In a nutshell, frustration may occur where the purpose of a contract is frustrated. We came across a similar scenario, although not quite the same, when we looked at the doctrine of mistake. Recall that under the principle of res extincta, under the heading of common mistake, meaning that both parties make the same mistake, recall that there may be scenarios where parties agree on, for instance, buying and selling something, and just before they reach agreement, the thing that they're contracting about is destroyed. Take for example a buyer of a car. The buyer comes to look at the car, the buyer tests the car, and a buyer and seller retreat into the buyer's house to negotiate the terms of the sale. After 10 minutes they reach an agreement. Unbeknownst to them, in the meantime, someone else, let's say a big truck, has crashed into the car and destroyed the car as it's parked outside. If the car was destroyed before the parties reached agreement, that contract would be void for mistake, because both parties would have made the same mistake, a common mistake, as to the existence of what it is that they were contracting about. And of course, where that thing is destroyed, the contract is void for mistake. Now what if, in the same scenario, the truck comes along a bit later and destroys the car a few moments after the parties have reached agreement? Now in that scenario, the contract comes into existence at the point in time when the parties reach agreement. It can no longer be said that the thing did not exist at the time of contracting. It did exist. However, such a contract may still come to an end due to the doctrine of frustration. So what frustration really is about is scenarios where parties have contracted about something and the contract has come into existence, but at some point after they agreed to contract, the contract becomes impossible to perform. For instance, because the truck crashed into the, into the car. There's many other scenarios that we will look at where the contract becomes impossible to perform. Where this happens, parties are discharged from performance and the contract comes to an end. This has not always been the case. In fact, the doctrine of frustration has only been around for around 150 years. If we look at the early case of Paradine and Jane, we'll find that the courts used to take a very rigid view. What happened in Paradine and Jane was that a landlord leased a piece of land to the tenant. The land was then occupied by the military. The tenant was no longer able to use it. The tenant refused to pay the rent. The landlord sued for the rent. The court said that since the parties had agreed on this lease agreement, and since the parties had not made any stipulations in case, for instance, the land became unusable, contract would be enforced. This may seem harsh, however, if we look at it from the perspective of freedom to contract, meaning that when the parties first got together they had freedom to decide on whatever terms they wanted to decide on, and so it could be said that it was their own fault, in particular the tenant's own fault, not to include any stipulations as to what would happen if the land became unusable. The courts softened their approach in 1863 in the leading case of Taylor and Caldwell. In Taylor and Caldwell, Caldwell, who owned a music hall, let it out to Taylor for a few days and Taylor was going to use it for some performances. Before the day of the first performance, the music hall burned down. Again, 
As in Paradine and Jane, the contract between Taylor and Caldwell did not include any clause as to what would happen if such an event were to occur. Taylor sued for breach of contract as the music hall was no longer available to him. The court held that as the fire and the destruction of the music hall was not the fault of either Taylor or Caldwell, but as it did render performance impossible, the contract had been frustrated. That means the contract came to an end at the point in time when the fire burned down the music hall. An analogous view was taken by the court in Krell and Henry. Krell and Henry is one of the coronation cases. These are a number of cases that took place in 1903 as well as 1904 where the issue was that the coronation of King Edward VII had to be called off because the king fell ill. Contracts that had been formed before the coronation and before the king fell ill, but which had relied on the coronation taking place, were affected by the cancellation. One of these cases is Crellin Henry, in which Mr. Henry agreed to rent a flat overlooking the coronation route. Mr. Krell was the owner of that flat. When the coronation did not take place, Krell sued Henry for the balance of the payment. Henry had already paid a deposit, but there was a balance due for rental of the room. His argument was that essentially he had let out a room to Henry and that room was available irrespective of any coronation taking place. In fact, their contract didn't even mention the coronation. However, the court held that the purpose of the contract was to view the coronation, and when the coronation was cancelled, that purpose was frustrated. Therefore, Henry did not have to pay the balance on the rent. Incidentally, Henry was not able to recover his deposit either because under the doctrine of frustration, the losses lie where they fall. We'll come back to this point later on. A definitive test for the doctrine of frustration was formulated by the courts in Davis Contractors and Ferrum. You sometimes come across this test as being called a radical change in obligation test. This is an objective test, and it incorporates three limbs. Before we analyze these limbs one by one, let's have a look at what the court said in Davis Contractors. Frustration occurs whenever the law recognizes that, without the fault of either party, a contractual obligation has become incapable of being performed because the circumstances in which performance is called for would render it a thing radically different from that which was undertaken by the contract. It is not hardship or inconvenience or material loss itself which calls the principle of frustration into play. There must be as well such a change in the significance of the obligation that the thing undertaken would, if performed, be a different thing from that contracted for. Now this is taken from the court's judgment, but if we read these lines carefully, we can discern this three-part test. Before looking at the details of this test, let's have a quick look at the facts in Davis Contractors and Fair. Davis were contractors who had agreed to build a number of houses for the District Council of Fair. Performance of the contract was delayed because of a rise in the cost of labor as well as problems with sourcing materials. In the end, Davis took much longer than they had initially agreed to, and secondly, Davis expended a lot more money than they had initially envisaged. They tried to recover by claiming that the contract had been frustrated. The court disagreed, and the facts are important here because they make us realize that although it had become much more difficult for Davis to perform the contract, namely because the 
materials were more expensive, and some of them were very difficult to source, as well as the fact that labor had become more expensive. These things made it more difficult to perform the contract, but they did not make it impossible. Hence, the court found against Davis. Now, let's move on and have a look at the three-part test in more detail. The first part, the first limb, is without default of either party. This is very important. Obviously, if one of the parties is responsible for the frustrating event, they can no longer claim frustration. For instance, in Maritime National Fish and Ocean Trawlers, Maritime hired a trawler from Ocean Trawlers. In order to use such trawlers, Maritime had to obtain a license. However, the government issued Maritime with less licenses than they had applied for. Ocean Trawlers trawler hence did not have a license and the contract was deemed to be frustrated at least at the trial stage. On appeal, the judgment was overturned and ultimately the Privy Council agreed with the appeals court. That is because there was fault with one of the parties, namely Maritime National Fish, for failure to obtain the requisite licenses. So where one of the parties is at fault in any way whatsoever, and here it was the fact that Maritime National Fish had to apply for licenses and was not given all the licenses it had applied for, this is not a frustrating event. Similarly, in Lauritsen and Weissmuller, which is a case about a ship called the Super Servant 2, which is why we can just refer to the case by the name of the ship. The Weissmuller agreed to carry Lauritsen's drilling rig from Japan to the Netherlands. The transport was to use one of two ships, either the Super Servant 1 or the Super Servant 2. Weissmuller chose to use the Super Servant 2. However, before the transport could take place, the Super Servant 2 sank. The Super Servant 1 was no longer available because it was being used for another purpose. Weissmuller argued that this had frustrated the contract. The court held that since Weissmuller had a choice between two ships, ultimately the contract was not frustrated. The problem of the sunk ship as well as the other ship being tied up with other business was self-induced. So once again, this was not a case of frustration. The second part of the frustration test is that there must be a radical change in the circumstances. Now, we already saw that in Crelin Henry where the king's coronation was cancelled. Another case which exemplifies this part of the test is the Fibrosa case. The Fibrosa case was a case of a Polish company who had ordered a machine from an English company. Fibrosa paid a deposit and the English company started assembling the machine. Before the machine was fully assembled, and that means before it could be sent to Poland, World War II broke out. Exports to Poland were no longer allowed. The court held that this was a frustrating event and therefore the contract had come to an end. So, in other words, there was a radical change in the circumstances. In Pioneer Shipping and BTP Dioxide, there was a strike at a port where a ship was to be loaded. Eventually, the ship owners redirected the ship to other tasks, claiming that the contract had been frustrated. The courts agreed. The strike at the ports had gone on for a very long time, and it was not clear when or if at all they would come to an end. Therefore, the contract for chartering that ship had come to an end due to frustration. Again, there was a radical change in the circumstances. The last part, the third limb of the test, is really the novelty which had been brought about by the judgment in Davis Contractors and Fairham. 